Oh, well, thank you very much, Courtney. That's all true that I used to work with Courtney. Uh, and I'm very grateful for the invitation to come and talk to you guys here at the Smart Hub. I know that I've been the beneficiary of a lot of uh, programs and events at the Smart Hub, and so I'm really keen to be able to contribute hopefully something today. Hopefully when you leave here today, you'll know something that you didn't know at the, at the very beginning. So I think we've got a number of Smart Hub members here uh, and some guests, and there may be some people watching on the video afterwards. So welcome along. Today, what we're talking about is business startups and how you choose the structure that you wanna operate with. Uh, so there's a number of different structure types. So I hope to run you through what they are, some of the pros and cons and other considerations, and then really look at the why of why looking at your structure is important in a business. So first things first, typical lawyer, I'll put up a quick disclaimer, but I try to make it as informal as possible. Um, but I just wanted to convey the general idea that law is a bit strange or a bit weird. Uh, with law, there's always a rule, but then there's always a million exceptions to the rule and then exceptions to the exceptions. And so it's really important uh, just that you guys understand this is general information, you know, so that you have a better grasp of all of these concepts. But please don't uh, run away from here and, you know, choose your structure uh, 10 minutes later and set everything up because uh, there's always specifics to your particular situation. Um, depending on you know, your tax, your family circumstances. Um, and it's important that you have that sort of one-to-one -one chat with a lawyer or an accountant to make sure that's right. So first up, I've got a bit of a random picture here for you. And the reason I have this picture, uh, it's actually a picture of me about to jump out of a plane back in 2016, which was a present uh, for my 30th birthday from Courtney and others um, to throw me out of a plane. <laughs> Uh, but I thought that this was an apt analogy for starting your own business. You're taking on risk. You're really risk takers. Uh, those of you who already have a business, those of you thinking about starting, um, you're definitely risk takers in the broader community. It's certainly uh, maybe an easier path to not be that business owner. So to make that choice, you're throwing yourself out of the plane and saying that you're willing to take risk in order to, I guess, better, better your own circumstances and those, uh, those other people in the community who you might be able to employ. So uh, I was actually here at the 3 a.m. founders event on Tuesday, and Eliz was also talking about Elon Musk's quote about being an entrepreneur, being like eating glass uh, and staring into the abyss. And so this is a bit of a similar idea, I suppose. I feel like I'm staring into the abyss uh, right there. So anyhow, uh, so the first thing that I wanted to touch on is the fact that we have a number of different ways that we can address risk. Uh, here we've got helmets and harnesses and a parachute, uh, but in the business world, choosing your structure and getting that right can be one way that you can help uh, protect yourself from the risks of business. But there's a number of other ways as well. So just to give this whole talk some context, starting at the very beginning, I guess, our basic legal system has a few different elements to it. There's certainly a few more than this, but these are the basics. And so we're operating in a world where we can enter into contracts with people. And that's where we voluntarily choose to enter into contracts, maybe with suppliers, maybe employment contracts, maybe our lease with our landlord. We can pick and choose those relationships. There's also some areas of law that we don't pick and choose. And these are legislation, which is the stuff made by governments, and common law, which is based on cases which come before the court. And you might have heard the phrase, you know, the doctrine of precedent. So basically judges try to make decisions that are consistent with previous decisions. And as each of those decisions gets made, the law develops along the way. And so that becomes part of the common law. So there's also a bit of a breakdown as to whether we're dealing with state or federal legislation. So just out of interest, because it's super interesting, um, partnerships and trusts are governed by our Queensland legislation, whereas corporations or companies are governed by federal <coughs> legislation under the Corporations Act. Yawn for that. So, <laughs> but um, 
that's something uh, that does really affect how we operate though to know which of those laws are impacting on us. So firstly, we'll start off by just looking at the four main options. There are probably even a couple of options outside of this and I'm more than happy if people have heard of those other options, we can do a bit of Q&A at the end, but these are really the main four. So we've got a sole trader, this is where it's just you flying solo, a partnership where maybe two or more people get together. Um, this can also include a partnership of other entities as well, just to complicate things. So typically you think of people in a, in a partnership, but there could even be a partnership of companies or a partnership of trusts. Um, so the next one is a company and the last one is a trust. So we're going to run through each of these and some of the fundamentals uh, and then talk about some of the pros and cons. Firstly, I just wanted to touch on changing your structure. This is something that unfortunately we won't really have a chance to talk about in detail today. And to be perfectly honest, it's not really something I think we can give a lot of value in a, a group session because changing your structure is so, so specific on which structures you're changing from. So if you're going sole trader to company, that's maybe a bit of a simpler one. But if you're going from a partnership into a unit trust or you're going from a company into a trust, all of those have different rules and they have different consequences. Um, I see Marnie in the audience. So there's a, a real accounting as aspect um, to these changeovers as well. So I just wanted to uh, touch on that, that basically, yes, you can change your structure, uh, but it's important to try to get it right if you can the first time, because when you change your structure, there can be costs associated. So on the tax side, there can be capital gains tax, CGT, or GST consequences. And uh, on the legal side, there can be stamp duty. Uh, because the way that the stamp duty office sees these transactions is that whoever you're selling your business or you're transferring your business across to is a separate transaction. So even though it might be your sole trader business and you've now set up a company, the Office of State Revenue sees that as you yourself selling it to this new company. I guess one of the most common things is that at the moment there is some, uh, there are some CGT rollover relief provisions and they apply for small businesses where the turnover is less than 10 million. Um, and there's a couple of factors with that, but it sort of needs to be a genuine restructure and there needs to be no change to the ultimate economic ownership. Um, but like I said, it's very much uh, a combo role between your lawyer and especially your accountant with these CGT rollovers. So I just wanted to kind of cover off on that whole changing structure thing, um, but we'll mostly focus on you know, how you actually choose your structure to begin with. And naturally, if you know that, you might know why you wanna change in the future. So the considerations that we might look at in deciding which structure is best for us, um, there's three that I've identified. Once again, there's probably more than three. You can think of a whole range of things. For example, some people think having a company just sounds more impressive. I haven't included that on the list, but that might be your reason. Um, so one thing is practicalities. Naturally, you can't be a sole trader if there's more than one person. So there's just some limitations as to what you can do. And we'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, the second driver of your decision is going to be that risk of loss of you know, throwing yourself out of the plane and hitting the ground. So what can we do to prevent that from happening? Um, and one way we can do that is through asset protection and through structuring, which is the main focus of today's talk. And the last one is how you actually save and keep more of your money. You know, how you avoid paying tax or minimize your tax. And so there's different ways we can do that by using the structures to our advantage. Um, obviously not using dodgy schemes to avoid tax, but doing it in a smart tax planning way that your accountant would be able to guide you in. So in terms of some of those limits, um, one human only for a sole trader, um, I put human there because later on we'll talk about you know, legal persons and, and who that entails, but the law sometimes calls these people natural persons. It's quite interesting that we've had to qualify it with natural because apparently there's other persons that are not natural persons. 
Um, partnerships, we can go anything from two to 20 in a partnership. Uh, for a company, for a small company or a PTY LTD company, we can go up to 50 shareholders. So I tend to think probably for most startups that's going to cover you. But if you outgrow that, you can become a public company. For a small company or a PTY LTD company, we've got only one director needed, whereas for a public company, we've got three. Um, these are different um, to the accounting rules for small and large PTY LTD companies, um, which I'll just briefly touch on. So for accounting reasons, if you've got a private company, there's different rules involved, whether you're small or large. I didn't put that on the slide. The test is a little bit sort of involved, but basically you've got, um, if there's 20, uh, 25 million in turnover is a threshold, and 12.5 million in assets is a threshold, and 50 employees is a threshold. And if you have two of those three right or under the threshold, you can be a small company. Um, I hope those thresholds are right. If I'm out of date, I'm just lost touch with my uh, accounting figures, but basically there's some key thresholds of revenue, of assets and of employees. And if you're under that, you can be a small company. And if you're over that, you're large. And the significance of that is that if you're large, there's more reporting requirements. Um, and the last one is a trust. So a trust uh, can have up to four trustees. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. And really an unlimited number of beneficiaries. So the beneficiaries do need to be defined. You can't just say the whole world is my set of beneficiaries. Um, but that is the trust. They're fairly unlimited in that respect. So we'll move on to our first one, which is the sole trader. So being a sole trader, sometimes people think that being a sole trader, you can't have a business name uh, like a company does, but you can. A business name is really just that. It's just a name that you want people to call your business by that you might use in advertising. And it gives you rights to use that name over, over and above somebody who hasn't actually registered a name at all. It's a lesser right though than a trademark, for example, and we won't go into trademarks, but uh, a trademark is a stronger right than a business name. So if you uh, try to use a business name and you've got someone tapping on your door that does have a trademark, uh, chances are they'll be able to stop you using it. Yes, Tanya. Are you still able to employ people as a sole trader? Yes, so yeah, you definitely can still employ people as a sole trader. Um, so you can, yeah, I mean, you can run quite a large business as a sole trader. There's no need to necessarily change over to a different structure just because you've grown large or you've got 20 employees. Uh, you can definitely still operate as a sole trader if that suits you for all the other reasons. So being a sole trader, all of your assets are combined basically. So if you've got a house in your own name and you bought business premises, they're all just owned in your own name. Um, there's no separation. Whereas some of the other structures, we've got some separation that we'll talk about later. Uh, the next one, a partnership, involves a couple of people or multiple people getting together. And in the Partnerships Act, which we talked about, it's defined as the relation which subsists between persons carrying on a business with a view of profit. One of the really big things or really significant things about a partnership is that you have joint and several liability. And what that means is, probably an easier way to say that is to have is to say that the partners have liability both individually and together. So if there is a liability of the partnership, anybody who's claiming on that liability can pursue all of the partners collectively or any of the partners individually. I once met a guy from Brazil who was telling me about the fact that his business, he'd really suffered a terrible business loss because he went into a partnership uh, and he only contributed 1% of the funds. And so he felt he was safe and only sort of at risk to the tune of 1%. Um, but his, you know, the whole business went bad and the lady he went into business with ended up becoming bankrupt. And ultimately they were able to recover all of the debts of the business from him, the 1% partner. And he had no idea that could ever happen. 
And yes, yeah, so th this is a major, major devastating event in his life. Um, and so it's really important to, to realize that and I guess to factor that in to whether you're willing to actually go into a partnership. Uh, next up is a company. So a company is basically a, a fiction, an invention uh, of people uh, under statute, under legislation, to say that we're going to pretend that this thing that we call a company is like a person. And like a person, they can do things. They can buy and sell things. They can enter into contracts. Uh, they can sue and be sued in a court, just like a real person can. Um, and so in a company, we've got some different characters or players being the shareholders. So the shareholders are the people who actually own it. So you might own shares in Telstra or BHP, so you're an owner. And that's different to the directors. The directors are the people that actually control the business. So day to day, they make decisions on the board. In that typical scenario, you've got like the BHP board and they're all sitting around the boardroom table. They're the directors. Whereas there will be many thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of shareholders for those large companies. Uh, the limited liability is for the shareholders as well. Sometimes people just loosely say, oh, companies are lucky, companies have limited liability. But actually the company's liability is not limited at all. Whatever assets the company has, if the company does something bad, people can sue the company for all of its assets. It's unlimited, but it's the shareholder's liability that, that is limited. And so as a business owner and as the human or humans behind this company, um, that's the real benefit for you, that you as the shareholder are protected from liability in certain circumstances. One thing that I wanted to touch on is just that this is not a magical solution or a, a complete protection. The court has the power to pierce the corporate veil, they call it sort of funny language, but basically they can, I guess, you know, pierce or reach in behind the company and grab hold of these uh, shareholders that are doing something dodgy. And if they're trying to just use the company as this veil or this shield, they can actually make orders against the individual shareholders. That's fairly rare though. So it's typically restricted to cases that are uh, involving fraud on the part of those shareholders or where there's a strong public interest element in sort of setting a precedent for holding people to account in certain scenarios. Another thing that I was going to just make mention of just as an interest thing, I've, I've got this book that I got a while ago actually called The Corporation, uh, written by Joel uh, Bakken, who's a professor, was a professor at the University of British Columbia in Canada, which is actually where I went on exchange. I think that's how I sort of came across it. Um, but it, it was just a really interesting movie to watch. It is interesting to think that whether, you know, when we're dealing with a company, are we getting decisions that a human being would make or are we getting different decisions and just what, what that means in society as to the different things that are going on. Um, it's interesting that in economics they have a special term for the potential harms that companies inflict on random third parties um, called externalities. You've probably heard of that before but um, you know, they've got a whole separate word to you know, describe these negative impacts that happen you know, to the environment or different social groups based on the decisions that are made by companies. And when we say made by companies, they're made by the people that actually control these companies. And the people that control the company are the directors. And really what their mandate is, uh, you know, there's some good, good stuff by people like Warren Buffett and others but the job of the director really is just to maximise profit and value for shareholders. And so when they're making a decision about, I don't want to you know, get all sort of environmental or whatever, but if it's cheaper to dump something in a, in a lake somewhere rather than dispose of it, uh, you know, there's an argument that from the shareholder maximisation of value um, tangent that that is the right decision to make to maximise profit if that's what your job is. Uh, but naturally that doesn't take into account the externalities that maybe have far-reaching effects. 
So in terms of different company types, we've got proprietary companies or proprietary limited companies. And typically the way we sort of know that, I guess, is we see this PTY LTD. You've probably seen that a lot. And that just means it's a proprietary limited company as opposed to a public company. So it means it's one of those companies that's going to have less than 50 shareholders. Um, there's also a couple of others there I'll just briefly mention, um, but they're probably of less interest to this group. Um, but there's companies limited by guarantee, which are typically only open to charities and not-for-profits. And it basically allows the people that start these up to provide a guarantee which may not even be for the full value of what you would buy a share for. So when you're a shareholder, your liability is limited to the value of your shares. So if you buy 20 shares you know, on, on, on the stock market, um, you're only going to lose the value of those shares, but no more. And so with a guarantee, you might be able to even put up you know, less than what you would typically put up as a full shareholder. Um, and because of this special nature of running the not-for-profit, um, the government allows you to have that limitation just by the guarantee you're providing that you'll put up a certain amount of money to the value of the guarantee if something was to happen, if there was to be a debt called upon uh, with the company. And the last one is really super rare, which is actually what we would all like, is a no liability company where you can't have any liability whatsoever. And the only people that get these companies are, are typically mining companies. But you'll be pleased to know that it's only in fairly limited circumstances. So once a mine is up and running, it's not going to be a, a no liability company. You know, BHP Billiton or Rio Tinto is not going to be li no liability. But typically these are exploration companies. And so because they're seen to be taking great risk and expending a lot of money and the government wants to encourage people to go and spend a lot of money even though there's only a 1% chance they're going to actually find a new you know, oil deposit or coal deposit. They allow them to operate in this special zone where they have no liability essentially. But for you guys, it's probably mostly the PTY LTD private company or a public company if you're kind of crossing that that 50 uh, shareholder limit, or if you otherwise just want to be a public, uh, a public company. You don't have to have 50 shareholders to go public, so you could have 30 or 40 and decide to do it at that point. I just wanted to throw in a bit of a practical slide just so that people had a very rough idea. Um, these numbers aren't precise, but in terms of the costs of setting up a company, uh, setting up the actual company documents would probably cost you $300 or more than, than that. You can certainly find people that definitely will charge you more than that, but that's probably a bit of a, a baseline in terms of document providers. Maybe there's some cheaper. And basically what this is, is just getting your company constitution from somewhere. So that might be from a, a law firm or a, a document provider or via your accountant. Um, there's also an ASIC company registration fee. So even if you were able to draft your own constitution, which would be quite a big job. I'd recommend probably not doing that and just getting one from somebody. Um, but you would have to pay this, this 479 fee, which is to ASIC. There's also an annual fee that you have to pay to keep being a company, which is 254 currently. And then there's your annual tax returns, which is essentially the money that you would pay to your accountant to handle the tax on behalf of the company. And I put there a thousand or more. It's one of those things. Maybe you can find accountants where a company tax return is less than that. Maybe, uh, and you can certainly find as your business gets larger and larger, it's going to become more and more expensive than that because the amount of work it's going to, to grow and the amount of bookkeeping and all of that. Um, but that's probably you know, just a, a rough starting point to have in your head. So I think the main reason I wanted to put this up is because Really, in the big scheme of things, it's probably not that expensive. I think that a lot of people might tend to think they won't even look at a company because, oh, I'm a startup and I can't possibly afford that. And that might be true. I'm not, I'm not sure what everyone's circumstances are, but I think people have in their head that to be a company, you need 
you know, twenty thousand dollars there to do this big setup. Um, where, whereas really, you can see it's it's not quite like that. And that way, if you are keen on some of the, the benefits of incorporation, you can tap into those by going through this sort of process. So the last of our structures, the fourth one, the trust. The basic ingredients of a trust are that we must have trust property. Uh, and so trust property is the money or even a property. We can have real property like land in a trust. Uh, we must have a trustee of that trust. So the trustee is the person who makes the decisions about distributing the capital and the income of the trust. And we must also have those beneficiaries. So that could be a range of people. And so beneficiaries of trust can actually be humans, natural people, or they can also be companies and trusts uh, and even charities that have been set up. The different types of trusts, the main ones anyway, are fixed trusts, discretionary trusts, and unit trusts. So a fixed trust is fairly uncommon in terms of a structure to, to run a business, but a fixed trust is really common in, in a will, for example. So when you leave your house to your brother Bill un, under your will, um, there's a fixed trust in place. And so your executor will pay all of the expenses of the estate. And then effectively that executor turns into a trustee and they're holding that house as the trust property. The trustee holds it. Maybe they're holding it while the bills are getting paid. They need to sort some things out. They need to appoint a real estate agent to sell it or something like that. So the trustee can then, if they're holding it on a fixed trust for your brother Bill, they will then make a distribution of that asset, either you know, the physical asset or it might be the money of that asset. They'll make a distribution across to Bill and they have no choice but to give it to Bill because in the, in the will it says that he is the sole beneficiary. So that's a fixed trust. A discretionary trust is what it sounds like. The trustee has a discretion as to how they distribute the income each year. The reason this is a good thing is that it allows for what's called income splitting, which is something that your accountant will guide you through each year. But the idea of this is that we can split income between all of these beneficiaries. And because different entities and different people are in different tax brackets, that means that we can maybe choose to do it in a tax effective way. So if our goal is to minimize tax, which it doesn't have to be, there's a lot of other reasons as to why you need to give money to particular people. But if your goal is to minimize tax, you might choose to distribute more income in a certain year to somebody that isn't in a higher tax bracket rather than distributing most of the money to somebody who's already earning you know, 400,000 a year and they're going to be paying at the top marginal rate. Um, so that's the idea of income splitting. And the last one is a unit trust. So with a unit trust, you'll have multiple people in there, but they have a set or a, a set entitlement, a fixed entitlement. And it's almost a bit like having shares. So you might have five people and five units in the trust. And what that does is it fixes the amount of the income that they get. So if there's only five units and you're one of five, you'll get one fifth of the income. So I feel like I need that uh, yawn slide again because I know <laughs> it's a bit uh, heavy going. But anyway, so that uh, is basically to symbolize that we can have a company as a trustee as well. So I try to get, use these shapes. I try to use them when I talk to clients as well. It just helps me think about things. But we can actually have a company at the top of this trust, which is really confusing when you're talking to people because you're thinking, are they a company? Are they a trust? They're saying they have a corporate or a company as trustee. What's going on? So in this case, we've got the trust is actually the economic or the accounting entity. So the trust really has the money in it and it's receiving income and paying expenses. And all this company does is it acts as the trustee rather than a human person acting as a trustee. But this company doesn't really have anything going on. It's got no assets, it's not receiving income. It just sits there to make decisions as the trustee as to how this trust income gets distributed in the trust. So we'll go on to do a few examples. And I've talked about this, I think with a couple of you guys. Basically, we have legal entities and then we have economic or accounting or, or tax entities, you might call them. I'm just sort of making up this distinction in a way, but 
the, the legal part of it is a, a really real black and white distinction that the law only recognises individuals or humans and companies as legal persons that can actually do things like enter into contracts and sue and be sued. So what that means is that if you ever just see the name of a partnership on a contract on its own, or you see the name of a trust, that there's probably a problem with that because we know that a partnership can't actually do anything itself. It can't sue people, it can't enter into contracts. Same with the trust, can't sue people or enter into contracts on its own. It needs the help of a person or a company. So I just thought I'd give you some examples to help try to illustrate that point. Um, so for example, if I was buying a property, I might put down the Fox Family Trust, um, but that would be wrong. <laughs> Um, and we sometimes see these come through, um, but that entity is not capable of buying or holding property on its own like that. However, if we were to put you know, myself as trustee for the Fox Family Trust, that's okay because we now have a human who's acting as the trustee. Equally, we could have you know, Fox Pty Ltd as trustee for the Fox Family Trust. So those things work in the green, whereas red is not what should go on a contract. Another example, which I've made up, uh, Able Fox Events, which is actually the trading name of a partnership. Uh, but once again, we can't just put that on the contract. That's actually nothing on its own. What is Able Fox Events? The law doesn't recognize that, aside from a very good events company. <laughs> anyway. Um, but what we could have, once again, is the two humans behind it and we can add onto the contract more just as a descriptive thing, the name of our partnership or the name of our trading name or even the name of our trademarked name. Um, and the last one um, is another trust. So this might be a land development trust. Uh, and again, we can't have that on its own, but we could have a company as trustee for the trust. So that's probably enough examples for now. So I guess returning to that first slide, this, or one, one of the first slides, which was the skydiving and why we actually care about this. You know, why do we actually care about what's going on here? And we're trying to pre prevent loss or protect ourselves from loss. And we need to do that by dealing with internal risks and external risks. These are just, uh, I guess, this is another distinction that I've just made up, but um, in terms of internal risks, I think about that in terms of your risks of things going wrong with your fellow partners. And when I say partners, they could be partners in a partnership, but they could be your fellow shareholders or your fellow trustees in a trust, whoever you know, you're actually doing business with. So in order to actually address those risks, you can look at different types of governance documentation which is another uh, yawn fest phrase, probably. Um, so the important thing is that all of these things are just fancy names for documents which cover off on a number of different things that you really should talk about in advance with your partners. It's basically like a prenup for business in a way. So it's dealing with different things that will come up in the course of your business, uh, how you make decisions, how you can resolve deadlocks, where you can't go forward in a certain direction, what happens if certain events occur, what happens if one of the partners dies, what happens if they lose mental capacity, what happens if they become bankrupt. You know, you might, might have a, a partnership, but what happens if just one of the three partners become, becomes bankrupt, what happens with their share? These are all things you can deal with in these documents. Part of this whole talk today on choosing your structure really ties in well or dovetails with asset protection. Uh, but asset protection is not just about choosing your structure. Um, and so there's three key ways that you can try to kind of quarantine your loss or quarantine certain assets so that they are protected from loss. So you might have seen before, sometimes there's a company that'll have, uh, you know, there'll be a large company like BHP and you'll see that it's got a parent company and then it's got a number of subsidiaries underneath that uh, and then even subsidiaries under the subsidiaries. And the reason that companies will do that 
is that they're trying to quarantine the risks associated with one business activity from the risks of another. To use another mining example, you, know, you might have extrata coal and extrata copper, for example, or you know, Rio Tinto coal and copper. And so that way, if something goes wrong with one of their mines and there's significant liability over here in copper, potentially the coal assets are safe. So it's the idea of separation. And so we can do similar things just in dealing with assets. One thing that you can do is to just transfer your property that you want to protect to somebody else. And so this is kind of the typical person who might be at risk, might be a, a doctor in a stereotypical scenario who transfers their family home or has their family home owned solely by you know, their wife or if it's a female doctor by their husband. Um, because they're worried about getting sued. So if they keep that asset in their partner's name, that's then safe from being sued via the business. Uh, another thing that you can do is if you really want to run the business just in your name, you can do that. But instead, you can transfer the asset into another structure. So all that really matters is that these things are separated. So it can either be you holding these, these assets yourself and you keep the business in a structure or put the asset into a structure and you can run the business yourself. So, how's everybody going? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we'll definitely do a bit of uh, Q&A, although uh, I think I'm quickly running out of time, but that's okay. Keep going, yeah. Yeah. So, we'll try to power through some of these pros and cons. And I'll just uh, grab some of my notes here because they are pretty heavy going. So we'll try to kind of gloss over them because I've given you all a copy of the slides as well. Um, and we have already actually run through each of these individually, but there are some, some new points in there. Um, so with a sole trader, that's the simplest, easiest, cheapest way. That's how if you just wanted to start a business today, go out and start selling, that's what you just will be. Um, and you may not even have anything in place. Eventually you'll maybe need to look at getting ABNs and setting up for GST and all of that. But I mean, you, you basically will be in business if you go out and start, you know, you start trading at the markets this weekend. You know, you'll be up and running as a sole trader in your own name. Um, the cons of doing that is that you've got that unlimited exposure to liability you know, it can be lonely and you've got a lack of support, resources, synergy that you might get by being with a group of other people. Um, and also there's limited finance options in terms of, you know, taking on equity, taking on other partners who might inject money. And there's a lack of business continuity. So, I mean, if you're a, a one man or one woman band, you know, if you die or lose capacity, that's probably the end of the business, which maybe isn't the end of the world. I mean, if if you're no longer around, maybe that doesn't matter anymore, but obviously the benefit of some of these other things like a company, it can keep going even in the event its founder passes away. Partnership, you do get that sort of teamwork and flexibility and there are fairly limited setup and compliance costs. Uh, we don't have those same costs as with the company, um, but there are still some things that need to happen like GST registrations and you might have a partnership deed that sets out some of those governance things. Cons, the big con is the joint and several liability that we talked about. Profits and losses are distributed to the partners who pay tax, whether that's good or bad, I guess it depends how much tax you're paying. Um, and there's a risk, once again, of something happening, death or incapacity to those partners. With a company, you've got that limited liability for the shareholders. Uh, there's more finance options in terms of bringing on equity partners and we've got a tax rate that's capped at the moment uh, and so for small business it's 27.5% um, and that's a flat rate of tax. So that may or may not be a good thing for you but obviously if you were to just be a sole trader and you were really killing it in your business, eventually you're going to end up in that really high tax bracket. So at some point it becomes advantageous for you to be paying that flat rate of tax. And the other thing with the company is that you can retain your earnings within the company. And so if your plan is to grow your company and keep reinvesting the capital to grow up bigger and bigger, 
that can be a good idea. And then the cons of a company is really a lot of those things around cost and red tape and documentation and not having massive amounts of privacy because you might need to report things. But as we discussed before, I don't think it's really as scary as what people think. Um, the costs are really not as high as what you might think. And at the en end of the day, there's enough red tape associated with other things. It might not be in the company setup, but if you're a sole trader you, and you're employing people, there's still all the red tape of employing people. So I tend to think once you get up and running, and if you're running a serious business, you're going to have to deal with a mountain of red tape anyway. So if you really like a company, maybe you should go with that. You, sh you shouldn't avoid that just to avoid the red tape of setting it up. There's also, so yes. I would say you have the advantage of um, full frame uh, dividends as well. Yeah, that's, that's right, which, which I understand is different in America. I don't fully un understand, but I understand they basically have to pay tax twice potentially. Whereas in Australia, if the company has already paid tax on it, you know, to the tune of 27.5% or used to be 30% uh, for small companies, um, basically you get a credit for that tax when it's paid out to you as a dividend. And then basically it depends on your individual income how much extra tax you pay though. So it's not necessarily tax free to you then because if you get a dividend, that, then that's income to you. And if you're still that guy that's earning 400 grand a year anyway, you're going to have to pay a margin on top of the 30% or the 27.5% you've already paid. But the point is you don't pay tax twice. So to the extent that the company has kind of covered your tax, you just have to pay any bump up that's appropriate, if that makes sense. And onto the last slide, or the last section here of trust. So trust can be good because of that income splitting ability that discretion that trustees have. Um, yes, no, no question. Um, there's also some set up and compliance costs in terms of the trust deed. Um, and also the profits need to be distributed each year. Um, and so you would talk to your accountant about the most tax effective way of doing that. The asset protection element of trust is not as good as with a company. However, you can beef up the asset protection by making your trustee of the trust a company. <laughs> so you kind of need that company to protect you a little bit because if you just have you know, Josh Fox as trustee for the Fox Family Trust, potentially when I enter into contracts, I'm going to be both personally liable and what I can do to protect, protect myself personally is I can indemnify myself or I can get money out of the trust so there is a level of protection there with trust, but it's not as good as with the company. Um, so again, returning to our, our why of trying to protect ourselves from loss, there's a number of different approaches. And I guess these are sort of like four pieces of the puzzle. And this idea of structuring is really only one piece. So in order to suffer certain types of loss, and we were talking about um, well, one, one thing that we can look at is those external risks of loss, like being sued under a contract, you know, your employment contracts, your lease, your supply contracts, you know, the, the risk of suffering or causing some damage in tort, they call it in law. Tort includes the law of negligence and also any loss that occurs under legislation, under statute. So for example, there's some legislation that just says, if you do this thing wrong, you will be liable. For example, in the Corporations Act, if you're a director and you're trading insolvently, and you know that you're trading insolvently, um, there can be penalties applied to you for that. Does anybody know why there's a snail on the screen? It's a bit random. Nobody? Negligence, snail, no? No, anyway, just me. Ah, um, <laughs> oh, yes. Ah, yes. Very good. Yes. Anyway, so it, it just, uh, I thought I'd do a quick thing on negligence. And so the law of negligence is really interesting. It didn't always exist. Um, we used to have to prove in some situations that there was privity of contract. Uh, and there was this really famous case in the House of Lords over in the UK, which was basically, uh, well, it's Donoghue and Stevenson, but it was a case where Somebody drank a ginger beer that they ordered from a cafe and it had a decomposed snail in it. And apparently this caused them 
nervous shock or basically trauma, psychological trauma from the snail. It seems like a bit of a crazy story, but basically, you know, they argued this case all the way to the House of Lords and it, this has set the whole precedent for the modern law of negligence. But the interesting thing is that we owe, everybody owes a duty of care to people that they ought to have in their contemplation as being so affected when you're directing your mind to certain actions uh, which are called into question. So this could be you walking down the street, this could be you in a whole range of different uh, scenarios, but if you do something and, and you should have people in, in your contemplation, um, you can potentially be found negligent. So I mean, if we left something really dangerous out here at the Smart Hub, um, somebody slipped over and broke their back, you know, that's where negligence comes in. And so in order to be negligent and suffer loss as a business person, you, you actually have to be negligent. You have to owe this duty to somebody first. You have to breach that duty by you not doing the things you should do to keep people safe or to prevent harm. And they have to actually suffer some harm as well. So it's not just uh, a, a paper loss that, oh, that looked like that could have been a close one. I could have slipped over, I'm gonna sue you for a million dollars. Well, you didn't actually slip over, you didn't suffer any, any actual loss. So I know this is a stupid thing, but I think people forget about this and they get so swept up in you know, insurance and they, they get so swept up in getting the structure right that they forget that there's actually practical things they can do in terms of policies and just being you know, a sensible human being um, to try to not be a negligent person and expose yourself to this risk. Um, this is all of what we've discussed today is really just this piece of the puzzle. And we found out that some of these entities, companies and trusts offer somewhat more asset protection than what a sole trader and being a partner does. However, it's not a magical solution. Yeah, um, well, yeah, I mean, you've kind of preempted the, the next section, which is insurance. So you can do whatever you can to try to prevent dodgy things from happening. You can have your structures in place to try to separate yourself. But another backup, which is a completely different category, is insurance. So if you can have somebody else pay for the loss that's been caused or for your loss, um, happy days, I guess. So um, I think it's really important to consider all of these things. Uh, it's up to you whether you want to actually take out these products. And the funny thing about insurance is that insurance is just governed by the law of contract. Like we were talking about before, there are some pieces of legislation, but ultimately, it's the document that you have with the insurance company that will determine whether they have to cover you for certain loss. And so that's why it's really important to talk to your broker or if it was a really, uh, you know, something you really need to be sure about, you might even go to an insurance specialist lawyer to make sure that you actually have cover for the things that you think you have cover for. Because there's, you know, always those stories and movies about people who, you know, they thought their house was covered in, a, you know, in the event of flood, but it wasn't. Well, they thought they were covered you know, in, in the event of you know, some particular yeah, director's liability, but turns out there's a little exception at clause 44A subsection B that says, no, you're not covered in this scenario. Um, so it's really important to actually read and appreciate those things because that's what's going to potentially save you in addition to these things. So firstly, you might say, oh, well, uh, my company's liable for that. I'm not liable, therefore my house is not on the line, so I'm protected. But if at the end of the day your insurance can respond and respond by, you know, that way if they, they pay out, you know, that can keep your company afloat. Whereas the asset protection method, your company is still going to go down the gurgler if you get sued for millions of dollars. It's just that you'll still be kind of okay over here. You'll still, probably still be traumatised, but you'll, you know, you'll still have your house. Whereas if you've got the insurance, well, maybe your company can just keep trading as, as normal. And that does happen. I mean, there's a lot of big companies where they are the subject of a big ca uh, claim. I mean, I mean, naturally as well, if your company is big enough to withstand certain losses, that's really, you could call that a form of uh, self-insurance in a way itself. If you're big enough, you can withstand a certain amount of hits in certain areas. And you see that in the real corporate world, I guess. And the last one is by contract. So in, in the contractual relationships we have with people, 
whether it's our customers that we're dealing with, our employees, we can actually put things into contracts to try to safeguard ourselves. Often these things are not perfect and there's a lot of complex case law that goes into whether they are enforced in all circumstances. But I think as business people, it is worthwhile trying to the extent you can. You know, I mean, you'll see I had a disclaimer here. That could have been a much more legally worded disclaimer, but at the end of the day, I want it to be a practical disclaimer as well as a you know, legal save myself disclaimer. Um, because the reality is all of these things do depend on your individual situation. So I really do want you to understand that. You will see these things when you're participating in certain activities. Maybe you go to yoga, your yoga instructor might have you sign a disclaimer to say that, you know, if you pull a muscle while doing yoga, you're not going to sue them. It's maybe arguable whether you would have such a right anyway, because remember first you, they have to show that you're negligent before they can sue you. People always jump straight to this and assume, oh no, my, uh, my yoga students are going to sue me and then I'm going to need this disclaimer. But I mean, firstly, they have to show that you were negligent. If you did everything you could possibly do and it was just all of their fault what they did, you know, you won't be negligent. But it's a good idea to have these things in here. And so once again, there's just some more fancy legal words, but you know, just things disclaiming or saying that I won't be liable for these things. We agree on that or my liability is limited, maybe to a certain dollar amount or in certain circumstances, or that the other person indemnifies you in a certain scenario. So you might even have a, a, you know, a joint venture going on. I mean, in theory, when I came to the Smart Hub today, because I might've been worried about somebody slipping over and there's a question as to whether, you know, that's council's fault or the Smart Hub's fault or my fault or the person who falls over are their fault. And so what I could have done if I was a really weird speaker would be to say to council or to the Smart Hub that I will not come and speak at your venue unless you give me a contractual indemnity in respect of any loss which arises through this event. And then when somebody slipped over, if they tried to sue me, I would just redirect that back to the council and say, oh, well, that's fine, you can sue me and you'll still have to sort of name me probably when you go to sue, but I have the benefit of this indemnity from council. So whatever's ordered against me will actually end up coming out of council's pocket. And so these are all things you can do, but of course, you know, it's not going to be easy to negotiate these things. And you'll find that, you know, even in a lease, there's often indemnities provided by the tenant to the landlord for certain things. And so, in, you know, indemnity, I always, in my letters to clients, tend to you know, put in brackets. That just means protect from loss. Or if it says you indemnify this person, it just means you financially protect them. So anyway, so in summary, there's these pieces of the puzzle as to how you can protect yourself from risk. So even though today's talk was about structures, really at the, the core of it, it's all about protecting yourself from risk. And there's a number of different ways that we can do that. Hopefully now you've got a bit of a better understanding of the four different uh, structures or the four main ones. And that's about it. Yeah, if anyone's got any questions, fire away. Yeah, Jason, you want to talk about that? Uh, trust, you can actually get a trust deed for pretty much the same, thanks Wendy, um, pretty much the same cost as that company documentation cost. There's a number of websites online. I mean, one of the ones I've used before the law firm Cooper Grace Ward, CGW Structures, but there's a million other ones, but uh, they're around that sort of, I think $390 or $400 or something like that for either a trust or for a company. My law firm doesn't actually produce these documents from scratch for people. And the reason I don't do that is because the law is always changing. There's new cases coming out. They're making tax rulings and all of these things. And so it takes a lot of work to stay across all of those things and to constantly tweak all of these documents. And so there's big law firms in, in Brisbane that have you know, five people or 10 people employed to monitor all of this law and update all of these precedents. And so it's much easier. And because they do that, you know, they become known for that and they mass produce these documents, they can do that for $300. Whereas for me to do that, it's gonna take me a long, long time to update those documents. It's just easier to go to one of those guys, whereas to pay me to probably do a trust deed from scratch or to really update and really like guide you through all of the steps 
you know, it might cost thousands of dollars, but because of the fact that they've got a ready-made document, you know it's up to date, um, because they've got a whole team of people that's dedicated to that. I tend to think that's the best way to go. Sometimes what I actually do, and I think a number of the accountants do this as well, um, we sometimes act as sort of a, a go-between. So we can actually take the instructions from the client. We know what they want. We know, you know the number of shareholders they want. And we can then kind of help them interact with these document companies just to make sure they get that part right. And so we might then charge a small fee to you know, have that chat, well, how many shareholders do you want? How many shares do you want? There's a lot of detail as well, which we didn't go into today, but you can have different classes of shares and voting and non-voting shares and all of the corporate stuff. And, and both lawyers and accountants help do that. Probably more so accountants though, tends to be the, the industry practice. Um, but yeah, any other questions? Yes, Monique. Yeah, that's right. I mean, if you signed a lease as a, a natural person and then you turned, you know, shifted your business into a company structure, potentially you'd have to get the landlord's permission to actually assign the lease or transfer the lease from yourself as a person to your company. At the end of the day, it's really not that hard. Like whenever you want to do it, I think I might have heard Marnie say before, I mean, sometimes people even think, oh, I, I better not do it you know, and, until the end of this quarter or until the beginning of the new financial year. And maybe that might be convenient, but I, I think we're all kind of equipped to deal with those events. Like when they happen, it's not that big of a deal. You can kind of you know, just tidy up the last quarter and move on to the new one. Oh yeah, sorry. So, so yeah, I mean, I would probably say, you know, I mean, if you're under really intense pressure because it's all you, it's all your things you're controlling, I mean, maybe you could do it, you know, in, in, in a week or something or, but uh, typically when, whenever we do a normal business transfer between unrelated parties, you know, between strangers, typically it would be at least a month. And so, you know, it would be nice, I guess, for us if you came to us, you know, with sort of like a one month time frame, then we can get things organized and plan it out rather than, you know, sort of the person who calls on a Wednesday and says, I want to you know, have a company structure by Friday. I need it done right now. Well, I guess my first disclaimer is that I'm not a family lawyer, but <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, there are agreements, much like we were talking about business prenups. I mean, there are prenups for relationships, whether that's a marriage or a de facto relationship. Um, and so people have different philosophical views on, or, you know, views on the romanticism of those agreements, but you know, in a really black and white business sense, uh, they are logical and they make sense. And if you enter into them correctly and both sides are informed and, and get advice from, from their respective lawyers, uh, those things are enforceable. So I mean, what, one good way yeah, to protect yourself from that loss is to have those types of agreements. Some of this asset protection discussion kind of ties over into that a little bit in the sense that if you have separation from your partner because you have a trust that's just in your name, uh, that potentially can sort of help you. <laughs> that's a terrible answer. But the, the reason why I don't think anyone should ever really rely on that is because uh, over the years, the family court legislation has developed so that it's so uh, so that the family court's powers are so so strong that they can tend to see I guess around and through those arrangements, and so if you've made those arrangements deliberately to just you know defeat your partner getting anything, you know it, it might be that you think oh well, you know there's 500 grand cash here and there's a 500 grand property and aren't aren't I clever the husband who put the 500 grand property in my trust. So now I'm going to get you know 50% of the cash, and I get to keep this house that's in my secret trust. Um, but it wouldn't, uh, most likely, wouldn't work that way. That the court would say, "All right, we can't actually touch that asset over there, but we see it, and so therefore you get that, and the wife gets the whole 500 cash because we see it." So, um, in terms of you know structuring, I tend to think that's not a very effective way in trying to protect from family law risk. 
but doing a, a binding financial agreement, which is what prenups are called in Australia, a binding financial agreement, is a good idea. And you can even do agreements after you've split up with your spouse or husband or wife um, after the fact, if you can cons consensually agree then on how to split the property. And then that, that can be enforced so that the person can't come back later and then say, you know, I want more. I, I actually am not happy with what I got. But anyway, that's the non-family lawyer's answer. Um, there's a number, of, you know, a number of very good practitioners in town who specialise in family law. Uh, we can all get back to work. But thanks very much, guys. Cheers. Thank you so much.